Good morning, everyone. My name is Ruth Rosenberg. I'm the Director of Arts Education here at the Robert and Margaret Mondavi Center for the Performing Arts here on the UC Davis campus. I'm so excited to welcome you all today for Words Take Wing and to hear from author Aaron Entrada Kelly. I do have a question. How many of you are here at the Mondavi Center for your very first time? How exciting, well welcome. And how many of you have been here before and are back? Yes, we love to see that. So those of you here for your first time, I'm, gonna, I'm looking forward to the next time, so I'll see you be raising your hand that you've been here before. So before we start the show, I just need to remind you of a few important things. Those of you with cell phones, please turn them off. There's no photography or recording of any kind allowed by uh, students or adults. And in the unlikely event of emergency evacuation, please exit through the nearest emergency exit and the ushers will assist you from there. Please join me in thanking the Friends of Mondavi Center members who not only serve as your ushers today, but also raise money to allow schools from all over the region to attend our school matinees. They, along with the John and Eunice Davidson Fund, have made it possible for a number of schools to attend today, and I'd like to welcome them. Oak Chan Elementary from Folsom. Oh, they're coming. Oh, here they come, all right. I was just welcoming you, Oak Chan. <laughs> Oak Brook Academy of the Arts. All right. And how about Freeman Elementary from Woodland? Yes. Science and Technology Cent Center. Yes, welcome. And Tafoya Elementary. All right. Okay, so now it is my pleasure to introduce the Word Take Wing co chair, Joanne Banducci. Good morning. With Wendy Chasen and our entire committee, Welcome to our 15th year of Words Take Wing. This year promises to be as memorable as years past. First, we'd like to acknowledge a few people. Dean Lindstrom, Barbara Celli and her staff from the School of Education, thank you for your commitment and for your enthusiasm. To the Mondavi Center staff, Friends of Mondavi and the School Outreach Program, we appreciate your collaboration. To our many donors, and particularly to Sutter Medical Center, Children's Center, we appreciate your donations. And to our committee, who work tirelessly every year with purpose, energy, and pleasure. I seem to be missing a substantial group of people. Yes, the students, teachers, parents, and chaperones. I think it's time for our fourth annual school mascot countdown. So, to begin. Where are the Timberwolves from Markham? The Eagles soar at Birch Lane School. Hello to the St. Rose Cougars. From Folsom, the Oak Chan Elementary Dragons. We have a lot of tigers here this morning. Tolina School and Bell Avenue School. Whoa. The dolphins are here from Oak Brook Academy. Where are the huskies from Harper School in Davis? And the Montessori, wow, the Montessori dragonflies from Dixon. Looking for the hawks from Tafoya and Patlin, right down in front. Three schools are the Falcons, Hazel Stroud, Freeman School, and St. James. We have a few robots here this morning. Science and Technology Charter Academy in Woodland. Hello, Browns Valley Bears. And welcome to students from Granite Bay, Montessori. 
Paragon South Elementary School in Davis and South Sutter Charter School in Placerville. We know that we have other guests here, families and homeschool students. Welcome. We are so pleased that you are all joining us this morning. Mizuki McCall will be introducing our author this morning. As a third grade teacher at Cambridge School in the Travis District, Mizuki enjoys her time with her students, whether she's out on the playground learning new dance moves or in the classroom responding to questions about children's literature. Mizuki McCall. Good morning. <laughs> Thanks. So as Joanne said, I'm Mizuki McCall. Growing up as an African-American and Japanese girl, I loved reading, but it was rare for me to see myself as the main characters in the story. I didn't think I could be brave like Matilda or overcome obstacles like Hermione. But with stories like Aaron's, I finally started to see myself as the main character and embrace the two cultures that, I, that shaped the person before you today. Today, I have the honor to proudly present the 2018 Newbery Medal Award winner, Erin Entrada Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> Just like me, and perhaps some of you, Erin is of mixed cultures. She is a mestiza, Filipina American. Erin draws inspiration from her experiences of growing up in Louisiana, the culture shared from her immigrant mother, and the life that surrounds her. When reading any of her stories, you see that her writing begins with the people. Erin has a unique way of capturing her character's thoughts and emotions that readers can invest in. She delicately unravels the challenges our characters face, whether that be overcoming our fears, finding trust in friends, or learning what it means to work towards a dream. Erin has crafted and written four magnificent stories, but do not be fooled, she has been developing new characters and publishing since she was just a little girl. See, Erin, young Erin, understood that our imaginations are something worth sharing, that they are untouchable palaces as long as we go into the right rooms to explore, wonder, and ask questions. If you can do that, you can do anything. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you this year's Words Take Wing author, Erin Entrada Kelly. Hello. Thank you, Ruth, Joanne, and Mizuki, and the Words Take Wing committee. And thank you for being here. I know how hard it is to leave school. Um, I'm sure you'd rather be in class. And there's robots here? Is that right? Oh, you, know, you look so lifelike. Um, speaking of robots, how many of you know who BB-8 is? A lot of you. Do you know that I bought a life-size BB-8? It's like, he's like this big, um, and he talks to you like he responds to you. Um, so I'm really into robots, but you look very human. It's a good job that you, yeah, see? Um, so, hi, I'm Erin Entrada Kelly, and those are my books. Um, my first book is Blackbird Fly. It came out in 2015. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the books later, but my second book, Land of Forgotten Girls, uh, came out the following year. So I've had a book a year, which is very fortunate. Um, and then Hello Universe, which won the Newbery Medal, it came out in 2018. And then I have, no, it came out in 2017. See, I don't even know what I'm talking about. And You Go First came out last year. And the one that you see in the middle there, Leilani of the Distant Sea, will release in September of this year. And it's my first fantasy. How many of you like to read fantasy? Awesome. Yeah. It's very much inspired by Filipino folklore, but I'll tell you a little bit about it in a minute. So how many of you, how, tell me if this is familiar to you, this next slide, right? How many of you have seen this? How many of you have done this in class? A few of you. Okay, I do a lot of school visits and I speak to a lot of schools around the country and this is a very popular assignment that I see young people doing and it's called an I Am poem. So when I was putting together this presentation, I thought 
um, okay, I want to talk about things that are important to me, um, and I want to think about what I want you to know about me and what I can hopefully give to you for when you leave here today on this rainy day. So I thought, okay, I'll do this I am poem for myself. Um, so you can read it, right? I am blank, I wonder, I hear, I see, I want, I am. So this is what I came up with. I am curious and creative. I wonder what if. I hear imaginary characters. I almost put I hear voices, but I decided to put I hear imaginary <laughs> characters. Uh, I see stories in my head. I want to share those stories. I am curious and creative. Now, I think it's important to know what your best traits are, right? I believe in self-awareness. And what is self-awareness? It's when you know um, all the best things about yourself and maybe some of the things that aren't so great. So I was thinking, okay, what are some of my qualities about myself that I'm most proud of that I think have served me the best throughout my life? And I came up with I am curious and creative. Now, I do have some traits. I mean, believe it or not, I have some traits that maybe aren't so nice, like... Um, when I'm driving, sometimes I say bad words when I'm driving, right? I'm sure you've never seen that before. Um, so there's certain things about me that, that maybe aren't the best, aren't perfect. I'm almost perfect, but not totally perfect. Um, but I am curious and creative. And why are those two things important? Now, you probably hear a lot about creativity, you know, in school and how important it is, I hope, anyway. Um, but curiosity is a very underrated trait, so I want to talk about that in a little bit. Now, what is awesome about being creative? Now, those of you who are already, who already uh, relish in creating things will know this, but one thing is, okay, get ready for some cuteness, you're right? Uh, cuter than this, even. Um, I know, I know. Um, see, I put that in there to capture your attention so that you would find me totally endearing because everybody loves a cute dog, right? That is my dog, right? How many of you have a dog? A lot of you, right. Um, how many of you think dogs are the most perfect creatures on earth? Okay, good. Um, so this is my dog, Marlo, and I'm going to get off track for a minute and tell you about him. I submitted a DNA test for Marlo. Now, what happens is you get a swab, you swab your dog's cheek, you mail it in, and it tells you what kind of dog you have. Isn't that cool? So he's a rescue. He's a mutt. I didn't know what he was. And it turns out that he is half Shih Tzu, half Maltese. Okay? So creativity fights boredom. Now, this is Marlo. I think he's pretty bored right here. Um, but one thing that's really cool about being creative is that um, it helps prevent boredom. Now... I'm going to confess something to you right now that I'm sure none of you can relate to. And it's that when I went to school a long time ago, I was bored a lot. Now, I know, I know it's shocking. I know it's shocking. Um, I did not really like school that much. I'm just going to tell you. Um, I would be bored a lot, right? And what creates boredom? I thought about this a lot, right? Um, whether you're a young person or whether you're a grown-up, I think one thing that causes boredom is that life can be pretty boring sometimes, right? In other words, every day can get kind of monotonous. You know, I mean, we have exciting things going on. We have friends. We have drama with our friends. We have people that we like. We go on trips. We do all this stuff. Um, but for the most part, you wake up, you go to school, or if you're a grown-up, you go to work every day, and it can get kind of monotonous, right? So... What I learned from an early age is that one way that I can fight this, this boredom is to find creativity in small ways wherever I could. And one of the ways I found that was not just through writing stories, which is a pretty obvious one, but even when I'm writing, because I always write pen to paper. I've done that since I was a kid, and that's how I write all my books. I start with a notebook and a pen. And the reason I do that is because I like to hear the paper, I like to see the ink on the page, I like to smell the paper. Um, I don't eat the paper. Um, now, when I was a kid, I'm going to confess again to you that I did eat paper sometimes. But I don't anymore, because sometimes I would rip the paper out of the notebook, and you know how it would have those little, like, crinkly things that would fall out? You know what I'm talking about. Sometimes I would just eat the, I don't know why. Um, I don't do that now. Um, but I do still use a pen and paper and notebook. But guess what? Even writing in a notebook can get monotonous, right? 
So one thing that I like to do is um, I sometimes will write upside down on the paper. I sometimes will write diagonally. You know they have lines. I, I consider those suggestions, right? Um, the lines that they give you. So sometimes I'll write diagonally. I'll use different colored pens and pencils and, and a lot of times I'll sketch. Does anyone like to draw here? Me too, I love to draw. So I won't just write, I'll also sketch. So I have for you, in a minute, we're gonna say goodbye to Marlo, I know it's sad. Um, I know. Um, and I'm going to show you some pages from my notebook that I have never shown anyone before, okay? This is not a story or a book that's coming out yet that I know of, but it's something I started working on and then I, I stopped working on it for whatever reason. But I want to show you how I get creative with my notebooks. See? This was a story. So every time I'm about to start a new story, I get a new notebook. And the notebook, the kind of notebook I get depends on the kind of story I'm writing. So in this case, I got a one subject notebook. The cover is red, because red is my favorite color, um, followed by yellow. And that, by the way, these notebooks are not laying on a bed of saffron rice, which is what some people thought. That is my yellow shag carpet, okay? <laughs> it is not rice. I do not put my notebooks on rice. I don't advise it. Although saffron rice is delicious. Um, so these are some pages of a story that I was working on, and you can see on the right-hand side, I mean on the left-hand side, uh, Goo Goo the Majestic Giraffe, right? So you notice that I wrote diagonally on the page, and I drew a sketch of the giraffe, and I drew some little leaves and all that kind of good stuff. And then you see I also used green to write the section for a character named Kyoko. Um, and then you see the lion, who's the king of the forest, right? Um, and I wrote vertically on the page rather than horizontally. And I even, I often will put words in the sketches. So you notice in the lion's mane, there's some words included in his mane there. And then we have the avian village where the birds live, and I did a sketch of that. And then Nanya, uh, who was a human character, I believe. And notice I didn't pay attention to margins there either. In fact, I think Kyoko's section in the green there is the only section where I follow the suggested lines, um, but I also wrote in green. So when we talk about creativity, I know we often think about drawing, writing, maybe music, but, and although those are all wonderful things and I hope all of you enjoy doing those things, not everyone does enjoy doing those things because we're all different, right? But there are many ways to be creative, not just, um, on the page or creating something from nothing, but just even in your daily life and the way that you think. Now, we're talking about creativity here, right? And the second one was curiosity. Now, I believe curiosity is a wildly and vastly underrated character trait, you know? Um, when I was a kid, and maybe some of you can relate to this, my parents would say, you ask so many questions. You, does anyone ever, you've heard that? Okay, good, good, I like this, I like this. Okay, and this means same, right? That's what this means, yes. Because also this, right? I'm, I learn a lot of stuff. Um, so they would tell me, you ask so many questions. Or, oh my gosh, you're just talking nonstop, asking questions, okay? So then I learned from some of the well-intentioned well, me, well -intentioned adults, I think they were just tired of answering questions. And those of you who have like little brothers or sisters at home, toddlers, they ask a lot of questions, right? They like to say why, 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 right? I have a daughter and when she was two or three, she would say, mom, why does the water come out of the faucet? Where does the water come from? How do we get the water? What about gravity? I'm like, I don't know. Um, so I understand that well-intentioned adults sometimes will say, you're asking so many questions. So then I learned, okay, maybe I won't ask them so, as many questions, but I'm still gonna ask them in my head, right? Because one great thing about our minds and imaginations is no one can take it away from us. So I'm constantly asking questions in my brain. Now, why is this important? Number one, people who ask questions change the world, right? People who ask questions don't just accept the status quo, they wanna know why. And guess what, once you start asking why, you realize that sometimes the answer is because it's always been this way. And that's not a good answer, right? Because just because something's always been this way doesn't mean it's the right way. Um, I'm also curious on not just these big levels like changing the world, but even 
when I'm driving around, you know, like sometimes I'll see a tree and be like, what kind of tree is that? What kind of bird is that? I wonder how long that tree has been there. Um, so I tend to, whenever I'm driving, I do tend to get lost a lot while I'm driving. I don't know if this happens to any of you, but you know, you're driving, um, you're on the interstate, right? You start thinking, you start asking questions, you, your imagination runs away with you, and then you get lost, you don't know where you are. You have to ask Siri, Siri doesn't understand what you're saying. Um, this happens to me all the time. Or I lose my phone, can't find my phone, where is my phone, I just had it, right? Um, the reason is because there's only so much room in this brain, and my brain is always moving. So I'm gonna show you something that also I've never shown anyone before. And my best friend in this, in this technological world we live in is Wikipedia. Now I know, and now I teach, I teach college, and you know, Wikipedia, you're not supposed to use Wikipedia as a, as a source, whatever you're doing, your research and stuff in school, but guess what? For everyday use, I love me some Wikipedia. Because I'll be watching, who likes to binge watch TV? Okay, right, we all live that, right? Sometimes I'll binge watch TV and I'll be like, I wonder who this actor is, what's his story, what's her story? I'll go on Wikipedia, I'll look it up. Or if I'm watching a documentary, I wanna learn something more, I go to Wikipedia, I look it up. So this is my Wikipedia search history. Um, now it's not very exciting, so don't get too excited. Not that you were, but. Um, so curiosity killed the cat. I was curious where that phrase came from. And then I was looking up a book, and yes, I did look up myself. Um, I'm not ashamed of it. Look, Aaron and Trotta Kelly, and I have to tell you, I have a Wikipedia entry. I did not write it myself. Um, someone else wrote it, I don't know who. And I also looked at the photo, because I wanted to make sure I look cute in the photo. Um, <laughs> Major Havoc is a video game. I'm writing a book right now that comes out next year, and it's set in, um, 1986. Now, I'm gonna tell you something that's gonna make the grown-ups in here very sad. And 1986 is considered historical fiction. So, yes, I know it's sad. Um, so, in my book, my historical fiction from the, the days of yore of 1986, um, when they had covered wagons and stuff, um, I have a character who loves video games. Who loves video games? I know a lot of you love video games. Yes, okay, so he is, he is obsessed with a video game, and I decided that his favorite video game would be Major Havoc. Now, probably very few, if any of you, have heard of this video game, but it was around in 1986, so I had to do a lot of research on it. Now, who likes sports? Specifically basketball. Do we have some basketball people in here? How many of you know who Julius Irving is? Oh, a lot of you know. Okay, good. So, the brother, so we have a guy, a kid who loves uh, uh, video games. He has a brother who loves sports. And the book is set in Delaware, which is where I now live. And Delaware, at least northern Delaware, is very much, a, we, we root for the Philly teams, right? And Julius Irving played for the Philadelphia 76ers. I heard somebody say it, that's correct. Um, he was called, does anyone know what his nickname was? Yes, Dr. J. So I did a lot of research on Julius Irving because my character, whose name is Cash, has a poster of Julius Irving in his room. And then Galileo, he's one of my favorite dudes from history, so I was reading about him. And then, you notice on the right, so I told you I got my results back from the DNA test on my dog. Um, he had some Schnauzer Shih Tzu Maltese, so I did a bunch of research on that. And the Super Bowl, who watched the Super Bowl this year? How many of you were so bored you could cry? Okay, as was I. So I watched the Super Bowl, um, and I was curious, is this the most boring game in Super Bowl history? Yes, so you say yes, okay. So I was curious, right? I was curious, is this the lowest scoring game in Super Bowl history and the most boring? It turns out that Super Bowl, uh, what is that, seven. Super Bowl seven was the lowest scoring game. See, I was curious, at least I think it was. Okay, so that's my Wikipedia search history because my brain is always curious. You have to open your brain up to ask questions of things that are happening around you, things that you see, right? Um, curiosity also fights boredom, right? Because there's always constantly something new to learn when you're a curious person. There is no end to the things you can learn about the world around you, about yourself, about your family, about your friends, anything.
right? Okay, so you put curiosity and creativity together, um, at least for me, and we get something called books. Uh, what if? So one of my favorite questions, in addition to why, how, is what if, right? So what if I wrote a story about growing up in Louisiana as one of the only children of an immigrant family, right? What if I did that? Um, and what if instead of writing books for this girl, um, her solace was in music? How many of you like music? Me too. Um, and her name is Apple, okay? And I do not play the guitar, uh, nor do I sing well. I sing, not well. Um, she has a dream, just like I did. My dream when I was Apple's age was to be a writer like Judy Bloom. And for Apple, she wants to be a rock god like George Harrison, who is her favorite. How many of you know who George Harrison is? Just the adults and some kids. Okay, good. George Harrison is the best Beatle, okay? There's four Beatles. Someone might tell you that he's not the best one, but he is. Um, so her idol is George Harrison. And then I thought, what if I wrote about two girls, two sisters who moved from the Philippines to Louisiana, and they're very, very poor, and they come here for a better life, but they discover that life is a lot harder than they thought it was going to be. And not only that, but they have a stepmother who is very mean, um, but how do they survive? How do they, how do they, you know, get through the day? What if it's by their imagination? And what if the older sister likes to tell stories to the younger sister to kind of help them get through the day and shield her from all the hurt that she has to go through? But then what if the little sister starts to believe the stories are really true and the big sister doesn't know what to do because uh, she doesn't want to destroy the magic for her little sister by telling her that she made the stories up, but she also wants to create a safe place for her sister, right? And then, hello universe, what if I wrote about a very shy, quiet, introspective boy who likes a girl but doesn't know how to talk to her because she is deaf and because he is shy and he doesn't know how to speak to her? Now, in this case, you know, Virgil's a boy and I am a girl, but Virgil is very much me, right? His name in the book is Virgilio, and my mother's name is Virgilia, so I kind of named him after her. But what happens if a boy who is very, very shy, who has never yelled a day in his life, finds himself in a situation where his very life is on the line, and the only way he can get out of it is to learn how to use his voice? Um, so what if also there were two young people? Now, I'm going to tell you, whenever I was uh, about your age, I would think a lot. Because that's another thing when you have a curious brain that never stops moving. How many of you have trouble going to sleep? Do any of you have trouble going to sleep? So did I. I like to think it's because we're really smart and our brains are just so busy, you know? Um, that's what I'm going with anyway. So whenever I was a kid, I could never sleep. I still have trouble sleeping to this day. And I would just stay up and think and think and think. And one of the things I would think about is how big the world is, right? That's where this curiosity comes from. Um, if you just take out a map or a globe and just look at all the countries and all the people living in these countries and you don't know them and they don't know you. And I started thinking, what if, what if I have a, you know, a best friend in some other country and I'll never know who they are because I'll never meet them because they live across on the other side of the world. Um, so what if I wrote a story about two young people who are friends, who are separated by, you know, 1,500 miles, but who change each other's lives without even knowing it? And their only connection is online Scrabble. So that's where you go first comes from. And then I thought, okay, what if? Now, some of you said you like to read fantasy, right? Now, one of the great things about fantasy, as you can imagine, is with these four books, I'm, I'm limited to the constraints of the real world for the most part, right? So where your curiosity and creativity could truly take off is when you're writing fantasy because now I can create any creatures I want. So then I thought, okay, what if a girl like me, and by like me I mean a girl who is pretty ordinary, 
Um, she's not the prettiest girl in her village. She's not the smartest girl in her village. She has no superpowers. She wasn't chosen from birth, you know, like Harry Potter or any number of, of young people. Um, she's just a girl, right? She's just an ordinary girl. And what if a girl like that found herself in a situation where she has to go on a quest to save not just her, her mother, but also her entire village? And what if she has to uh, get on this boat and sail across a sea, and no one knows for sure what's on the other side, and she has to face all these creatures? For example, there's a an eel woman. She has the body of an eel and the head of a woman, and she's very mean. Uh, she likes to drown anyone who tries to cross the sea. And what if there is a, a little tiny insect, right, the size of a mosquito who's actually a sorceress, and what they do is they bite you, and they infect you with um, a deadly virus, right? But they're sentient. The, the, little, the little creatures, the little mosquitoes, they know what they're doing, right? Um, and what if this little girl also has to face uh, trees that eat people and shapeshifters and all these different kinds of things? But she's not particularly brave, remember? She's not the idea of what we think of as brave anyway. She's just, like I said, an average ordinary girl like I was. Now, I had to think about this. How would I do all that stuff? Because I don't consider myself, this will shock you, but I don't think I'm that tough, you know? I mean, I know I look like I could really beat someone up, but I don't think I could, you guys. Um, so what would I do if I was on a quest and I was faced with all these things that are bigger and badder and meaner than me? How is a girl like that going to survive? And can she survive? Especially when people before her were so much stronger um, and had so much more might than she presumably does. All she has with her to protect her, by the way, is an arrowhead, which she carries in a pouch around her neck. That's her only weapon. Um, so in addition to not having what, what she considers not having the moxie to fight all these things, she also only has an arrowhead with her for protection. So how is she going to do that? You know? Um, that's a big question that I had. And... What's another thing about creativity and curiosity that I find wonderful is that, um, for me, it saved me. And what do I mean by that? When I was growing up, um, and probably some of you feel this way, unfortunately, but when I was growing up, I was very sad. I was very lonely. I was bullied a lot. I didn't feel like I fit in with anyone, because I kind of didn't fit in with anyone. That's why a lot of my books have characters who don't fit in, um, who are called misfits. Usually people call them misfits kind of social outcasts and kids who are trying to fit in by being like everyone else, but they know they're not like everyone else, but they don't know how to fit in. That was me. And on top of that, I was quiet and introspective. And I liked to be in my room with books. Um, my mom used to say that, you know, when my sister would get in trouble, my sister was like a volleyball captain and a cheerleader. She was very outgoing. She had about 50,000 friends. So if she got in trouble, my mom would say, go to your room. And my sister would storm off, blah, blah, blah. you know how it is, uh, slam the door. Psh. Um, but with me, if she would say, go to your room, I'm like, okay, right? <laughs> That's where I want to be anyway. Um, the problem is when you're a kid who's introspective and likes to spend time alone, those times when you want to be with people and you want to be with friends can be even more lonely because you're very much an outcast. So for me books um, and writing became my safe place. Whenever I was in middle school, it got to the point where I didn't even want to go outside for lunch because I was being bullied so badly, and I didn't have any friends. So I would actually turn, instead of going down the hall to go outside for lunch, I would turn into the library um, because I liked to read and I liked books and I felt safe there. But who wants to spend their entire childhood lunches in the library, right? Lunch is the best subject of the day. Uh, so after a while, you're in there and you just feel even worse. Until one day, a girl actually came up to me. Her name is Ellen. And she said, um, if you want to come sit with me at lunch anytime, you can. So the next day, I sat with her at lunch, and then we became best friends. Because whenever you have people around you who are true friends, it, it's harder for people to bully you, right? You don't feel so alone either anymore. So uh, this is me. Um, 
See, I think Marlo got more alls than I did, but that's okay. <laughs> this is me, right? Uh, um, being that little girl I just told you about. And I am obviously, I am writing a story. Now this big clunky ancient thing that you can kind of see next to me is a computer an, of the historical days of 80s. Um, so I would write on pen and paper, as you could see, and then I would type it. Sometimes I'd type it up in the computer, but sometimes I would just staple the sides. Like you could see, those are some of my stories. Um, right there on the loose leaf paper is the Golden Valley Twins. Now, some of you, especially the um, teachers, probably remember a series called Sweet Valley High. This is a total ripoff of Sweet Valley High. <laughs> Because when you're young and you're, you're uh, trying to figure out what kind of writer you want to be, you just copy other people. Um, so Not anymore. I don't do that anymore. Um, but back then I did. And so this is the Golden Valley Twins, right? And I illustrated my own works, I'm happy to say. And then right next to it is a hardcover that's cardboard. So I wrote this book and I thought, well, all the best authors have hardcovers, right? Because hardcovers are very fancy. Uh, so I decided I needed a hardcover, so I got some cardboard from my dad's office, and I taped the front and back and made my own hardcover and illustrated the cover, as you can see. Now, you can't tell this, but the name of the book is, is supposed to be The Two Orphans, but whenever you're working alone and you don't have a copy editor, it becomes The Two Orphans. So this is about the two orphans who live in an orphanage. Um, yes. So, to this day... I still create characters, not just in my books or not just even in my head, um, but also I draw. So a lot of you like to draw, right? These are some of my drawings. Now, the cool thing about drawing or writing or even songwriting or playing an instrument or singing at the top of your lungs in your room to Taylor Swift or whoever you like. I'm on a Taylor Swift kit because I just watched Reputation uh, on Netflix. Um, is that it can just be for you, right? So even your um, journal, if you keep a journal at home or if you are listening to music in your room and you're singing at the top of your lungs, who likes to do that? Singing along to music at the top of your lungs. I so highly recommend it. Um, your parents may not you know, think it's a good idea, but I say do it. Um, and then if they tell you something, you can say, Aaron said I could. Um, these are drawings that I did just for me you know, they're, they're just like characters I invented. It doesn't necessarily mean anything, but I just thought they were funny. Um, in the upper left hand is a sloth, and he's going to work, but he's very lazy, as you can see. He's got his clipboard, but he's not happy um, because sloths are, right, they're lazy. You know, they sleep 23 hours a day. That's like almost all the hours of the day. Um, then I wanted to show you this. This is fan art from young people such as yourselves who sent me things that they made for me. Um, one of them up there in the upper left is Stick Man. Um, it's a story of a stick man who lives with the Teen Titans. Um, and then there's a self-portrait of me, bottom left, and a bookmark. And then those are the characters from Hello Universe that someone drew, which is very cool, right? Um, so what are my takeaways? And then we're going to invite up here. We have a very awesome group that is going to do a reader's theater for you. But what I want to tell you really quickly is, you don't have to be a writer, you don't have to be an artist, you don't have to be a musician. Um, you just be the best you or the best uh, version of creativity of you that you could be. But I encourage you to be creative, be curious, write upside down on your paper. Um, maybe, not, maybe not with school, I don't know if your teachers, ask your teachers if you can. Uh, draw pictures. You know what? You know what's another silly thing that I do that makes no sense? Sometimes when I'm at the store and I have to sign my name to like a receipt or something, I sign with my left hand even though I'm right-handed. Why? I don't know. Um, just to do something different. Even those little things that you could do every day to switch up the monotony of our everyday lives, um, you'll be surprised how much that will ignite your brain to be open and curious and creative and want to try new things. If you have a favorite song, another fun thing I like to do is if I have a song that I love, I like to go on YouTube and look up covers of that song that other people have sang, just to hear what their take of it is. Um, sometimes whenever I eat takeout, I'll order something off the menu that I have no idea what it is. Um, I have to tell you that sometimes that's a grand failure. Uh, <laughs> but sometimes you discover something delicious, like mushy pancakes. Um, 
And another thing I'll leave you with is a lot of, a lot of young readers, when they read my books, they want to know how the story ends, right? Because sometimes this, my, my books end and they're not necessarily tied up in a neat bow because life doesn't tie up in a neat bow all the time. And so I encourage them to come up with their own ending or if they want to rewrite my ending. Or if you see a movie and you think it's terrible and you thought, oh, that ending was terrible, think of how you would end it. If they're coming out with a new superhero movie and you don't like the actor who's playing your favorite superhero, you can ask yourself, who would I get to play that role? These are things that don't necessarily uh, affect the world in any big ways, but it affects the way your mind works. And the more you do that, the more curious and creative your world will become. And I know it saved me, and I believe it can save you and all of us, actually. Now, here we go. We have, are we ready? Okay, this is gonna be the best part. <laughs> no pressure. Um, we have a reader's theater coming out. All right, yes. Yes, please clap, please clap. I'm so excited, you guys. Okay. Okay, so are you guys ready? You ready? All right, here we go, presenting the Reader's Theater. Today we are going to tell you the story of a group of misfits. Even though they aren't friends, their lives will cross paths in unexpected ways. This is Virgil Salinas. He is 12 years old. He is very shy. Virgil's family calls him Turtle because he won't come out of his shell. He hates it when he call, they call him that, but he keeps it to himself. He keeps everything to himself. Virgil already regrets the rest of middle school and he's only just finished sixth grade. I'm the smallest person in my class the weakest and the skinniest, the most forgettable, and always pick last for teens and PE. And on the last day of school, when I should be happy, I feel like big failure. Everyone has secrets. Virgo has two. Secret number one, he's afraid of the dark. Secret number two, he has a crush on a girl in his class named Valencia Somerset. Unfortunately, Virgo has never spoken to Valencia. He hardly speaks at all. He doesn't have many friends, but he does have Gulliver. Gulliver is his pet guinea pig who trips every time Virgo comes home. Valencia Somerset is fierce, smart, and independent. She has two secrets. She keeps having nightmares, and she's afraid to go to sleep. In my nightmare, I'm standing in a big open field surrounded by thick clouds of people, and a girl in a blue dress steps forward and says two words, solar eclipse. I know what she's saying, even though I'm not wearing my hearing aids. As soon as the moon finishes passing the sun, I look down, and just as I suspect, everyone is gone, the whole crowd. The moon has pulled everyone away, all but me. I'm the only person left on the face of the earth. Valencia has made a promise to herself. If she has another nightmare, she will ask someone for help. This is Chip Bullens. Virgil secretly calls him the bull because he haunts Elm Street like an animal in the loose. The bull is always ready to charge, always fired up to make fun of someone. Sometimes Virgil expects smoke to spew from Chet's nostrils. On the first day of school, Chet is outside shooting basketball when Virgil walks by. Virgil does what he always does. He ignores the bull. Hey dummy, hey weirdo. Don't you hear me talking to you? How come you never say anything? Are you too stupid to talk? The bull laughs like he always does, and Virgil imagines an alternate reality. In his imagination, Virgil looks at Chet directly in the eyes. He grabs the bull's shirt collar in his skinny little hand and shoves him against the nearest tree. Virgil lifts him up and throws him across the neighborhood. But this alternate reality doesn't exist. So instead of saying a single word, Virgil takes off running. He runs all the way to the house of the 12-year-old Kaori Tanaka. Kaori likes to tell people her parents were born in the high, misty mountains of a samurai village. In the truth, they are from Ohio, but that doesn't matter. Kaori knows they were meant to be born in the mountains. How else can she explain her psychic powers? When Virgil arrives at Kaori's house, he can smell the incense drifting down the hall from her room, which he calls the spirit chamber. 
Other than her bed and rug, there was a table for incense, an enormous complicated poster of constellations stacked to one of the walls, and books shoved in corners. Can you tell me my future? Yes, I just need to concentrate. I see you in a dark place. That's because your eyes are closed. No, I mean a really dark place. Soon fate will bring all four of these misfits, Chet, Virgil, Valencia, and Kaori, into the woods near their neighborhood. Each one of them will be searching for something. Kaori said she needs five stones so she can see more of my future, so I'm searching for the best stones I can find. I'm searching for sacred a stray dog that needs food, affection, and a home. I'm searching for snakes. My friend John said he found snake skin in the woods. Big deal. I'm gonna find a real snake and I'll keep it as a pet. I'm searching for Virgil. He was supposed to bring me the stones, but he's gone missing. No one knows where he is. My second sight tells me that something is terribly wrong. The discoveries they make will change their lives forever. Hello Universe by Aaron and Charlie Kelly. There are no coincidences. Thank you, that was amazing. Um, so didn't they do a great job? My name is Wendy Chasen, and I'm the co-chair of our committee, Words Take Wing, and we've been really working hard to have all of you come here today, and these students have been working hard and practicing. It's hard to come up here. Um, when I'm standing here, we can hardly see any of you, just a lot of light, so it's kind of a scary thing, but they did a great job. So um, we want to thank our author, Erin Kelly, for a great um, discussion about her books and how she writes. Um, I would like to thank our students, and maybe you could just give a wave when I call your name out. These students are from Dixon Montessori in Dixon, California. So our first narrator was <laughs> Abigail, wave. <laughs> Second narrator was Ben. <laughs> They're getting into it. <laughs> Um, Virgil was played by Noel. Noel, wait. Um, Valencia was Lauren. Chet was Chris. <laughs> and Kaiori was Willa. Ah, oh, very nice. <laughs> okay. Um, so you guys could sit for a minute. They're going to get their pictures <laughs> taken. Um, so some other thank yous before we leave today. Um, once again, we want to thank all the ushers that helped today. Because without ushers, we cannot have our performances for many, many reasons. So let's give a big clap to them. There are lots of people at the Mandavi that make this happen. There are people back here with all kinds of equipment, people up there with more equipment. It takes a lot of equipment and a lot of people, so let's give them a thanks. And you all wouldn't be here today if it was, wasn't for your teachers and parents and chaperones, so let's give them a big hand. So this is kind of a special day for me as well. This hasn't ever happened to me before. Well, my granddaughter's been here. But today, my brother and sister-in-law are visiting here from North Carolina, and they're waving over there. So, <laughs> so I think I did all the thank yous, and of course our committee 
and I think they were mentioned before, and they're scattered everywhere doing all kinds of things. So um, next year is another year, and we've already got our author in place for next year, and she's an author I used a lot when I was working as a librarian. Her name is Linda Sue Park. Uh, look in your classroom libraries or if you, your school library for her books. She's a great writer, and we're really excited that she's coming. So I think, um, have I covered everything? I think so. <laughs> There's lots of things to cover. So um, once again, let's give Erin a huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, I knew I forgot something. So in the lobby, we are selling books. The UC Davis Bookstore is here. Um, if you get a book, you'll be getting a small book plate that Erin Kelly has signed with her signature. So be sure to check out there if you're interested in Hello Universe. There are many other books out there, some of them at a really good price. So oh, we don't. Of course, she has one more thing. <laughs> I'm just going to keep saying things so you have to keep clapping. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so if any, thank you, thank you. Uh, so what I want to say is, I forgot to mention this. At the end of my talks, I always encourage young people, if you are a writer, an artist, or a bookworm, or create any, anything, really, and you would like to share it with me like these people did, this is just a little smattering of things that I've gotten. Um, I have a website, erinandtradakelly.com, and there's a contact me, and it goes straight to my email. And you can also connect with your teachers, and I'm sure they will find a way to get an address to send me something if you like. I love getting fan art and letters and mail. It makes me feel super legit. So if you want to do that, I encourage you to please do that. And if you've written a story or started one and you want to share it with me and get my thoughts, you can do that as well. Okay? That was, okay. Now you can clap again. Thank you. Okay, so here's the really important part. We have to move uh, quickly and quietly. So when I was teaching and a librarian, we, I would always say to my students in a big assembly, please look to your teachers and they will guide you and tell you when to get up and when to move out. And thank you so much for coming today. I'll clap for you. <laughs> we like to clap.